Great, well, welcome. Um, fantastic that you could all come. Um, so, we are talking about the representation of LGBTQ characters on screen. And because there's been a lot in the press, especially the last week, the last couple of years, both positive and unfortunately more recently negative as well, I decided to open the panel with a poem which I wrote a couple of years ago about why pride is important. Because sadly, a lot of people um, question why pride is important. Um, it is in a short film format as well, which you can watch on YouTube, but I'm gonna perform it live now. <laughs> I don't get why we need a pride, the gay kid said to me. It's just a piss up with your mates in public company. She felt an obligation to show her condemnation, a justification or was it provocation? We've already got equality, so now you're showing off, you see. Screw your lack of chastity, your public non-conformity. She attacks my identity with an air of animosity. I don't thrust my sex life in your face. The way you do is a pure disgrace. You say you want equality, but label everything you see. It's just a crap decision because it causes more division. There's missing the point, and there's missing the point. It's fair to say she's missing the point. You know, in part, you're right, I said. I'll have some drinks tonight. But I'll tell you how outright it wasn't our birthright. Because I was born in the 80s under Section 28. Illegal in the militaries to even love your mate. Gay books were banned in libraries, teachers could not accommodate. Questions like, what's a dyke or fairy miss? How do they fornicate? Because I was a kid in the 90s, into the noughties too, out all day, all night too, just hanging with my crew. I never met anyone who said they were gay. That's hardly surprising at the end of the day. Because if I had a done, they would have been beaten. It's not a choice that we could have chosen. Sure, my area was homophobic. It made sexuality seem abstract. But it really wasn't that long ago that being gay was a no-go. I thought lesbians were like unicorns, a myth did not exist. I waited almost 20 years to find what I had missed. But all that time, I only heard gay or dyke as a swear word. Other labels non-existent. At least with that, they were consistent. It never used to be like that if you look at history. The Greeks and Romans, others too, can teach a thing or two. Some of the most educated civilizations had gay relationships across the nations. They didn't then discriminate. They let them be and illuminate. See, pride isn't us showing off our sex lives. It's simply a public high fives to those who fought for human rights, to live our lives without the fights. It's our way of saying thank you because it shouldn't be an issue. We're not hurting anyone. Equality can be done. And it is. We can marry. Be out in the military. Show a solidarity to those who are not as free. I am an individual, most definitely I'm sexual. My image is contextual, labels not contractual. But when I was forming my identity, none of it was there for me. So now, I like to celebrate this very basic human right because all of that is nothing when you look around the world. You see the hate and suffering, it really can dumbfound. Killing that's unmentionable with morals that are questionable to even voice this poem could be a death sentence. To listen to it, just as bad. It really makes no sense. But campaigners of LGBTQI have really put off their hide, so now you question and say, why do you bother with a pride? Because you've only seen equality and plan to adopt a family. You are out at school now, out at work, at the gym, social networks, and every year we make a fuss, say, let's go march or float a bus. You think it's really evident we're being really decadent. I like that. I really do. It means we've changed a thing or two. So I wanted to share that poem because I wrote it about two, three years ago now, but sadly 
people still question it, and sadly, things around the world, although lots of positive things have happened, sadly, there's a lot of negative things that have happened as well. And I want to really talk about how that impacts how we represent queer characters on the screen. If we should represent that, or if we should just focus on the positives as a whole. So further, uh, before we go ahead, what I want to do is I want to introduce all of our fabulous panel. Um, so we have got the fabulous Nicole Faraday. <laughs> Star of Bad Guys. <laughs> we have got uh, Naomi Bennett, who is CEO and founder of Lesbix, who is distributing queer content. And we have got Emily L. Buddle, editor, writer, and producer. Editor, writer, director, no producer. <laughs> <laughs> director, I was missing things, my bad. <laughs> and of course, the lovely Ralph Bogar, who is one amongst many billions of things, the host <laughs> of Unicorn Nights, which screens queer content in London. <laughs> so I'm going to ask each of you to tell us a bit more about your current projects and what you think is important about queer representation, and then we're going to go into a bit more depth. So just in a, in a nutshell. In a nutshell. Um, so. As you stated, I, I run uh, Unicorn Nights, which is an LGBTQ-focused film night. Uh, its home is at the Prince Charles Cinema in Leicester Square, and we show classic uh, queer films and shorts, as well as uh, contemporary or brand new documentaries or films, um, and try and reach, get an audience for those films that maybe you wouldn't get seen. And the reason I think that's important is because, you know, a lot of people think that queer content is um, somewhat unnecessary, um, has been we, all the stories have all been told, um, and they don't they don't have a, a place in all because we have, as you said in your poem, um, achieved a lot. But there are huge amounts of, of of films and stories that haven't been told, especially in you know for women, especially I, you know I, as someone that's watched hundreds of hours of films, you know I found that a lot of films are very much focused on a certain demographic. And my job and my desire is for Unicorn Nights is to break that mould and try and show films that appeal to a much wider demographic, um, whether it comes to um, ethnic minorities within the queer community or uh, films that haven't had a message. For example, there's, I, I could probably think of maybe two or three films that deal with any kind of bi uh, issues, and usually they're really pretty poor. Um, so, you know, these are, you know, I'm, I'm trying desperately to find uh, content that. Um, speaks to uh, not just our community as a whole, but the minorities within our community. And having an, a, a, an opportunity to do that in central London, in the heart of Leicester Square, in the, in the heart of the film land, I guess, of, of London, is, is a great opportunity. And, you know, I was really proud that the first, and still a number of the films that I screened, which hadn't been seen in years, especially some of the classics, ended up being picked up, shown at the BFI, and being put on Netflix. So. It's, a, it's proof that there's a market for these things and it's great that, you know, that we have that opportunity to do that and I'm glad to be a part of that. Uh, my name is Emma, uh, Emily, um, and I am normally an editor, so I'm a film editor, but I decided to start creating content instead and I want to focus on like positive lesbian content because I don't feel like there's enough out there. Thanks. Awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, so I jumped back um, backwards and I went into writing and then um, directing and we just uh, did our first short called The Date, which is about two women who meet on a dating app and um, go on to have their first date and we just see how the first date goes. Uh, and yeah, that, that's so from now on I want to continue writing and continue creating um, that content. So yeah, hi. There you go. Hi, Naomi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, Naomi Bennett. Um, I've just launched a new website called Lesflix, um, and actually the reason I've done that is because for about four or five years I've been going to film festivals and seeing some amazing women's films, short features, documentaries, 
And then I realise that they're not getting distributed. Or even if they're getting distributed, they're not getting to the women who want to watch them. And I'm seeing one side women saying, where's the films? And they're saying that they've watched Bound and But I'm a Cheerleader in the 90s. And then the only film they seem to mention from the last 10 years is Carol. And I'm like, hang on a minute, you're missing 95% of the films, all the independent films. So I had a look and was like, well, hang on, what's the problem here? And I was like, actually, the problem is there's no real easy way to get those, those films out there. LGBT platforms we have, the women's content's less than 10%. So if a woman finds the platform, subscribes, watches the two films, then goes, well, hang on a minute, I've watched everything, unsubscribes. So it became clear we needed a really specific, dedicated space. So it's going to be screening the films, but also subscriptions. I'm really basically wanting to make sure the filmmakers get some money back so they can make more. So I'm putting myself out there and saying that basically it's a social enterprise. 50% of gross subscriptions are going to go back to filmmakers as royalties. Because I'm fed up with all these deals where everyone goes, oh, you're going to you get this car. But actually, after all the expenses, you don't get anything. So I'm going to basically do it on gross so that it's really clear, really transparent. 25% uh, is going into grants fund to do top-up funding and then 25% to run the site. So I'm basically at the moment collecting films and at the same time collecting pre-registrations to launch the video on demand platform. The website's already live, that has a database as well. I'm trying to list every film I can find with a lesbian by storyline in date order of release in the UK. So that again, you don't have to kind of try and find just what the films are called, you can look there as well. So it's just about visibility, representation, making sure people can see these amazing films because the quality is absolutely just leaps and bounds ahead of where it was but people just aren't seeing them oh. <laughs> yes hello i'm nicole um as helen said uh, i was in the television series bad girls um which many of you may know was very groundbreaking for the time it started in the late 90s when um, there was nothing really like it around it's long before the days of orange is the new black um, it was the first primetime drama series that showed uh, a lesbian relationship as being kind of the main love story, um, as well as showing the um, in and outs of uh, prisoners' lives and kind of highlighting their issues as well as, you know, both, both sides of the bars, really. So it was quite groundbreaking. As well as uh, doing film work, I've got three films coming out this year. Um, I also trained in musical theatre. So I played this the end there you go. Um, <laughs> Just so, um, so have the same writers and producers. So yeah, basically Bad Girls is uh, written and produced by uh, Shed Productions, which is two lesbian couples and a gay man. So obviously they're very issue based. They wanted to get, you know, LGBT issues out there. Um, but the same writers and producers produce Bad Girls the musical which I played Shell Dockley in, uh, in the West End and in every kind of workshop production, and I've just finished doing it again in a little fringe version up in North Gate London. Yeah, the Gatehouse, yeah, I played oh, Shell there. Yeah. Um, in fact, some of the members are here. Hey, which is very nice to see you. Um, so yes, yeah, so I've, um, I'm from the LGBT community, and I've been a very strong part of it. I've been in things that have been a very strong part, both in television and theatre. Um, but what I was saying to Helen earlier is, from my point of view, a couple of days ago, I watched just because I was at home um, some a bit of a crap American B movie, just something to watch. It was about some woman being stalked by her ex-husband or something. But at one point, she went to visit her cousin, and her cousin ran a coffee shop with her girlfriend. And literally, nothing in the film at all was even made of the fact that they were a lesbian couple and they lived together and they ran a coffee shop. And I just thought, this is so refreshing because it's just. It's just, they're just there. It's not like this is about a lesbian relationship. It, it wasn't made an issue of, and from my point of view, that's what I would like. I would like the inclusivity to mean that in mainstream films and across the board, there are gay couples, bisexual people, etc. And that it's not even, it's a gay film. It's just that gay couples are very much a part of society in the same way as that hopefully education is gonna change from next year. I know my niece is, is five and they're bringing in the fact that suddenly it's gonna be normalized, which I think is so important. So that's what I'd like to see more of. Very well said. Um, absolutely amazing guest here. Um, loving all your stuff, so awesome. Um, what was brought up then though was about being out in the industry. So my next question is, do you think that in 2019, being out in the industry has either positive or negative or any impact whatsoever on your career. 
Um, and if it has perhaps in the past, I mean, for my part, I was told when I was a lot younger to never be out in the industry as I wouldn't get work. Um, in America, it still can be very problematic. But uh, for the UK, what are your thoughts on that? Um, who'd like to go first? Do you want to start that end in my back or start do you know, I am lucky, and I, I don't know if it's just because I've done a lot of musical theatre, where obviously there is a, there are a lot of gay people in that in that industry, um, and also my main my breakthrough role was on Bad Girls, so I think I've been very fortunate in the fact that the jobs that I happen to have had, that hasn't been an issue. I'm not saying that it isn't an issue for other people, but I have, I've never felt that being bisexual or being in a relationship with a woman has hindered or help, you know, not in, in either way, it hasn't really affected my career, I don't feel. I mean, I'm only just new into the industry. I think from what I have seen is you can do a tipping point. People like Ellen Page, Kristen Stewart are getting some amazing films. What I'd probably say though is they're independent films, so they probably don't pay as well. So it's something to consider there that you're probably not going to get paid as well. You're probably going to get to do some really interesting projects and do some really interesting stories, but there was probably a payoff in the sense that maybe what's offered to you isn't quite as broad or as well paid, which then obviously you can start looking at all sorts of issues there. But we do seem to be on a tipping point where more independent films are getting bigger releases. I think in the first month of this year, I saw four films with lesbian content in the mainstream cinema, and I was like, what the hell happened in January? Sorry, don't worry, it's stopped now. We're back, you know. <laughs> But again, though, we've got another film, Booksmart, coming out, which is going to hit mainstream release. So, it, January was a bit of a fluke. Um, but I'm hoping it will continue. Um, but yeah, well, you know, there's more coming through, but they're a proportion. And I think you've got to decide what you're in it for. If you're in it for the money, don't come out, get your mainstream career. If you're in it for really good storylines, if you want to make a difference, if you want to help with the visibility, the representation, take the pay cut take the really good independent scripts and help get them bigger, because I think that's where that kind of difference is. So it's, it's definitely changing, but it's, there's, there's, there's pros and cons, and it's got to be down to an individual. Maybe if we have better ticket sales and box office, then we don't need to take the pay cut going forward long yeah. term anyway, but yeah. <laughs> um, uh, well, I work in film and TV, so like as an editor, or normally an assistant editor. Um, I don't know if I wouldn't get the work if they knew I was gay, but once I'm in it, I do feel very like, oh, maybe I shouldn't mention this, or maybe I shouldn't talk about that, or maybe. So, I mean, like, I was working on a Christmas film for like six months last year, and um, I was working with a great, like, female editor, and we got on really well and stuff. And even just talking about my feel my film, I felt a little bit like uncomfortable. Like, she asked me what it was about, and I was trying to like sway away from it a bit and just so I don't I don't know I think it's the individual person though, you know because if I was more confident I was like fuck it I don't care what they think then I would just tell them but I think it's just me but now as well I worked um, on a TV drama last year and I'm now really close to the male director who's much older than me but he because I kept saying oh yeah my partner lives in America or my partner is doing this or and they're doing that and whatever and then he just went, who is, who is your partner? Like, what, what does that mean? Who is this? What is it? And he kind of knew in a sense, and I ended up telling him. But then it gets to the awkward place where, like, he starts to ask me all these questions. Like, how is it for you guys? I'm writing a script. How, like, I want to maybe put, like, a lesbian relationship. How's your relationship? Oh, I think my daughter might be. And I'm just like, I don't want to talk about any of this. Like, you wouldn't ask us to, like, a straight dude or a straight woman or something. Yeah. Else. But, yeah, so. Character mining is really <laughs> frustrating. <laughs> yeah, um, I think, um, like, yeah, you touched on that. I, I do a lot of different things. I, I mean, I, I'm here primarily because I do Unicorn Nights, which is the film night I do in London, but I've also been an actor, a professional actor for 13 years. Um, I've worked in on stage, film, TV, um, uh, all kinds of things, cabarets, I direct, I, I produce, I do all different things. Um, and I do think that they came very much at the beginning of my career because I don't necessarily, um, you know, because I'm quite stocky and then, you know, the, the, the kind of stereotype of a gay guy, it, especially in the like 
the late 90s, early 2000s as very spell uh, flamboyant, and I don't, I'm not necessarily that way. Um, so people didn't make that assumption of me, but I've never, ever, ever held that back. Like, if, you know, I'm, I'm just who I am. And the minute anyone else says, ask me a question within the industry, I've always been very open about my sexuality because it's really got no bearing on my ability as an actor. I portray many different people. I played a serial killer in space. You know, I'm not a serial killer and I don't live in space. You know, it's true though. It's ridiculous. Um, um, but I find it very interesting that this conversation does come up and um, on the flip side in that, um, for example, Darren Chris recently said that he's now not going to play any more uh, queer roles because he's a straight guy. But his career, he's played pretty much predominantly gay characters. He was in Glee um, as the, the, the main like uh, gay male love interest. He was just in the Gianni Versace uh, miniseries. Um, oh, play. Which, which one was he? Darren Chris. Um, he was. He played the murderer. Yeah. Oh, he was brilliant. Yeah, yeah. I mean, very repressed, you know, yeah, character. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he's played, you know, Hedwig on Broadway. You know, I met him backstage, it was lovely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, he's, he, for him, he said that, you know, there's a, he had to acknowledge that, especially in the States, as you said, that there is a, a sense of limiting. When someone is out and openly out in the industry, the industry will limit you. I've been told before, you know, oh, the feedback. He came across a bit light. What are you talking about? What, the, what the, you know, if does that mean? Are you talking about my skin tone or, you know, but there is, there is, there is a subtext. And the fact of the matter is there is still homophobia and there is still um, an assumption that because you are something that you aren't able to play something. Um, and it's, I'm really happy to hear that you, you've managed to carve out that, 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 that niche for you. And I certainly have because I've basically gone well, whatever, I will do what I want to do. And I've completely embraced who I am and, and actually made certain career choices that have embraced all of the elements of my personality, sexuality, identity, you know. Um, and, but I have heard many, many stories, I don't want to say there is certain actors that we know who have been out, who have gone to Hollywood, gone in the closet, <laughs> had their PR manage all of that mm. and remove their queer history for them only to have that thrown back at them and then to sort of come out again a bit. And it's like, I'm talking about a big actor, a big Hollywood yeah, yeah, actor. Yeah. You know, I think I know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, you know, this happens and this is what we're, you know, this is a, this is a fact. And, it, and, and it, there are certain elements and certain people that still live in a, a, a kind of mindset of limitations. Um, and that's why being represented in film and TV and on stage is, is extremely important. And I think what Darren is doing is kind of interesting because he's saying there are people that are limited, that are good, and why don't they have those opportunities? I'm not sure if that's a great choice. It's kind of a double-edged sword because then you're also saying, well, only queer people yeah. can play queer characters. So I think that's a discussion to be had, but... Um, it's interesting, and the fact that that is, that is happening means that there is issues still around in the industry. Yeah, there is. Um, for some areas, it's, it's not an issue at all, and for other areas, it's a huge, huge issue. People will literally boycott TV series and films because of uh, the actors who are in it. If they don't have... I, I'm not even going to phrase it how they would phrase it, because mm. I disagree with the way that they would phrase it. And um, I think we all know what I'm referring to there. Um, one of my... Next question was going to be, do you think that LGBTQ films should be made and portrayed by queer actors and crew? If so, why? Um, and do you think that should be the case going forward in time? Or do you just think it's an interim thing? And what do you think can be added by that? Or detracted? I think I have this fight with myself every day <laughs> when I write and stuff and I think about actors and characters and stuff. Um, but I think what I've come out with is actors are actors, that's their job. Like, a straight person can play a gay you know, person, a gay person. Like, for me, my favorite actress ever is Ellen Page, and she's so versatile. Like, she can, if she makes out with a dude on, on the screen, you kind of forget that she's gay, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, like, it doesn't, it doesn't mean it. But for me, when I'm making something, I want the crew to be mostly queer, because I want them to be able to relate to 
the film and to what we're um, trying to make. Is that if you're making a queer content yes, film? Yeah, yeah, right. Totally right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, just, just, just to clarify. Yeah, 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 sorry. I don't make straight films. What? Well, no, no. <laughs> just kidding. Um, no, just because I feel like they can help even in their own way to bring the story out a bit more. And like I said, an actor is an actor. If they're really good at what they do, they, I choose them. It doesn't matter what their um, sexual orientation is. And at the end of the day, for example, like uh, one of the girls in my film, I didn't know that she was Pam, and I chose her before I even knew that, and then she turned out to be part of the community. So yeah. make it does And also, someone said, just because you think that an actor is straight doesn't mean that they are straight. So yeah. for all you know, like 90% of Hollywood is gay. I don't fucking know. Nobody and that's an interesting <laughs> point. You know, you know I mean? At the end of the day, it's your private life. It's like, why <laughs> should you have to be yeah. out? Do straight people have to come out? No. So it is frustrating. However, when stories aren't being told, do we have a responsibility to be out to show representation so that other people feel that their lives are normalised, so that they're okay to be their true selves? So it's interesting, just today on Facebook, um, in one of the many groups I'm in, the conversation was about how many lesbian thing films are made by men mm. um, and obviously the male gaze is very different and they were like asking the question of like why is this and I was like I imagine it's funding because you know women generally it's really hard to get funding so obviously like that means there will be less women making those films um, and that's a challenge in itself as well I mean more recently there's been more kind of focus on that and there is now some kind of women only funding which again I had someone talk to me who was saying I really want an all women team, that'd be amazing. But I know a really good guy and he's so talented. And obviously, you, at the moment, because we haven't had the investment in the women, are, can you get the right level of talent to me and make sure your film will be the best it will be so that it will actually go as far as it needs to go? And then again, I think that's where maybe you need to look at, say, mentoring, sponsorship, executive, like have the experienced guy come on in an executive role and mentor the woman. There's ways we can be a bit more creative and come around some of those kind of challenges rather than just kind of, and I think the thing is don't allow it to continue. We need to challenge it. I just want to pick up on something you said at the beginning of that uh, with regards to the male gaze and the films that end up getting released that especially when, when it's women focused films as a programmer um, I've got to say that I had the lowest attendance for a, a female made lesbian f you know you know film um, and the highest attendance for like which a film I didn't, didn't really want to show but you know I just wanted I showed it because it had a big cultural impact but also um, I was curious to what would happen, and Blue is the Warmest Colour sold extremely well, and I don't really like... It's Marmite. I don't really like that film. It's Marmite. Well I, I understand that. I understand that, but I just found it very... I, thought, I didn't find that... Uh, yeah, the male gaze in that is, is very apparent. Um, but that sold well, and, the, and women don't seem to... Aren't, don't seem to go and see the films. And it's, and it's, and it's frustrating because I showed, for example... Um, has anyone heard of... Oh my gosh... I've forgotten the name of the film now. A lesbian love story werewolf movie with Kylie Minogue in it. What? Jack and Diane. <laughs> see, look, you're great. Yeah, right? Oh, see? Really? See? <laughs> Jack and Diane, it's great. It's a great movie. I screened it. We had like. Great. We had like 26 people, you know. It was, and it's fantastic. There's a great animation in it. It's a brilliant movie. You know, Kylie plays this really good, like, dykey tattoo artist, you know. <laughs>